Hey everyone, I'm Jeff Gibber, the president and chief strategist of True Voice Media. I'm also the host of Conversations, the True Voice Media podcast where I bring on fascinating people from all walks of life and pick their brains about social media, entrepreneurialism, success, and so much more. For around the next 30 minutes, I get to have a really interesting conversation. You should stick around and listen in. So without further delay, let's get started. Episode 38. Man, am I jazzed for episode 38. I've never actually opened the show like that, Pam. Normally, I do it very soft, very soulful, very smooth. But because of this episode 38 with you, Pam, I am opening with excitement. On the show today, I have Pam Didner. Pam, you are freaking awesome. Tell everybody why. Well, because I live in Portland, which is a quirky little town. It totally yeah. is. Yeah. So when whoever is listening, you know what? Stop by and visit this uh, little city that tucked in in the Pacific Northwest. It's a wonderful place to live and also to visit. And uh, what else? I'm awesome. <laughs> well, I'm awesome just well, because I know you, Jeff. That I- is true. You know, I like to think that anybody that knows me is awesome. But you are specifically awesome. You have several talents. You might have even written a book about it. Yeah, I wrote a book about global content marketing, and um, I know that uh, some of you or majority of you who are listening probably have heard the term content marketing, and I wrote a book about how to scale content across regions, and it's more focused on the internal process, how to set up a process to do that within a company. Oh, God, there's so much juicy stuff here. I want to dive right in. But before we go into all of that meaty good stuff, I want to talk about this chick that quit Instagram because you just wrote a post about it. Can we do that? (laughs) <laughs> okay, which one? <laughs> you wrote the post about the girl, I forget her name, the Australian 18-year-old that had all the Instagram and Snapchat followers and she quit Instagram. How do you say her name, Isana? Uh, I don't even know. She's Isana. very pretty. Yeah, I think she's beautiful, by the way. Yeah. yeah. But you wrote a post about you know things that you can learn from her quitting. The first thought is, uh, what do you make of this whole her quitting thing? Do you have an opinion on that? I have opinions. Um, I do. I... <laughs> You know what? I really think she's just stressed out. She has been doing social media marketing um, three years ago when she was 16. She's only 18 now. I mean, almost 19. All right. And uh, she has been doing social media day in and day out. And in order to do it well, to gain followers, she has to post a lot. So for three short three year time frame, she posted over 2000 photos on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are high quality, great and beautiful photos. And that takes a lot out of you. I, you know, I don't want to overthink it. I think she's just stressed out. Yeah. And she just want to be away from social media for a little while. And um, I, you know what? She grew up with social media. That's the only thing she knows. I think she will come back. That's just my bold prediction. Well, I mean, <laughs> it would be kind of odd at 18 for her to be like, I'm done with it forever. And as you noted in your post, she's still doing YouTube and, and a blog. Right. She does. She does. But uh, you know what? I think she just stressed out. And uh, I applauded her effort of quitting Instagram for a little while. And she deleted the account. And she had more than 500,000 followers. To walk away from that, I don't know. That was a pretty risque move, but good for her. That is that is definitely a bold move on her part. There were a lot of people that were like, hooray for her. And then there was a lot of people kind of spitting vitriol from the other side. I did see a really funny response video. I'll have to send it to you. And it's this YouTube star who has a very tiny voice, and I forget her name, but she basically was talking about how that was this girl's experience and how her experience was something different, and she was much more vulnerable and shared more and all that sort of good stuff and and really, you know, approached it in a very different way, so she had a different experience. I totally agree. I think, you know, social media is what you make up, right? And uh, some people use social media purely just for family communication. Some people um, use it to express uh, herself, and I think for um, Asana, I, I think that's how I'm going to pronounce her name. I think I'm totally off. For her, she she went all in for three years. And everything she produced is top of notch. And then she gained the followers because of that. And I think she just wants to take a break. Yeah, and she didn't have a team. She did it all by herself. So let's, let's yeah. go into the thing where we talk and about the team. Sister. That's it. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, on some of the, the posts, uh, she did, uh, she redid the captions for a lot of the Instagram photos before she deleted her account. And then she re she did a lot of recaption, if you will. And she was talking about, hey, you know what, for this specific shot, it looks beautiful. But it was more than, I took more than 100 photos to get it right. And after I got it right, I have to edit it relentlessly for different channels. And uh, for a one-person content marketing team, that's a lot of work. And uh, I was looking at her and, uh, look, and reading some of uh, the articles that published by the mainstream media. And I look at myself and I was like, I did not even spend that kind of time on my content. So yeah. it's for her that she gained over half a million uh, followers and uh, baffle me and shame on Pam that I only have, what, 6,300 followers on Twitter. So... You know what? I need to work a little harder, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's what most people would say is that you need to work a little bit harder. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because writing a book, traveling, speaking, all that sort of good stuff. Yeah, that you probably yeah, should sleep hard. less. Yeah, I really need to go o o in. Yeah, not to sleep for probably seven days straight. Yes. Yeah, take it to the next level, Pam. Come on, step up your game. All right, so, I will. I will. So your main area of um, – you know, what you've been fascinated by, you've spent a good portion of your career is in this global content marketing and really the idea of how you organize teams to create relevant content for the right audience. And and you're a big, much like me, you're a big proponent of planning. Can you give me some idea about what your basic premise is? Kind of what's your overall theory or um, kind of starting place when you talk to someone about this? Okay, uh, that's actually a very good question. Thank you. I think there are a couple elements um, before you start content marketing. And um, um, I always tell people is one most important thing is understand yourself well and also understand your audiences well. When I say understand yourself well, and if you are small businesses, you, you kind of have to look at yourself inside and uh, to, to, to know who you are and what you stand for. Uh, but if you are a big company, uh, when I say a big company or for a corporate marketers working in the big corporations, to understand yourself well is really to understand your company well. And there's a couple of things that uh, you can use to understand your company well. The first one is the business objective. And uh, the second one is the product messaging and then product positioning. The third one is uh, your brand and the creative guides. Those are the things that you should know and to understand your company well. But for a small companies or for you know a small team, you usually don't have a very formal documentation to understand yourself well. Then is your conversation with your senior management, and then is the content that you created. There got to be some sort of look and feel. There got to be some sort of a, a personality about your company that you need to uh, unleash that uh, for your content marketing effort. So one thing from my perspective is understand yourself well. Okay, let me ask you two questions on that real quick. So well, you, you mentioned objective messaging and brand from knowing yourself well. Do you ever find yourself getting into a little bit of a loftier conversation about what the overall mission and purpose of the company is? Go, you know, go really big about what's the impact you're trying to make in the world, not just what your objectives are in the next year, but what are your objectives as uh, as a company? What do you wanna, what's the big impact? Do you ever go that deep? Yes. And, and uh, what I, you know, that's actually a very good question. Of course, you have to understand why and the overall mission of your company. I get that. Usually, I don't say that right away. Is Sometimes when I say that, it takes a so high level that people cannot bring that down. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, 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 so absolutely. You just tell uh, the, uh, uh, the protection, uh, practitioners that you focus on business objective. And that information will come through. Um, in the brain guides. So if you, if I have read uh, a bunch, uh, several companies' brain, uh, brain guides or um, the um, uh, creative guides, if you will, usually the first couple slides will talk about um, the brain persona and also the company's mission and company's values. In order to create a brain persona, the mission and also the value needs to come through. And a good, good brain guide or creative guide usually have that cover in the first two pages. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. So the second thing that, that kind of triggered for me is you, you distinguished between small businesses and large businesses. 
And you said that one of the big differentiators is that the big business is going to more likely have their objectives, their messaging, and their brand guidelines kind of spelled out. Do, yeah. Would that mean that you would suggest that smaller businesses take that step and do that planning, write down their objectives, write down their messaging uh, sort of constraints and guidelines, and, and really identify what their brand is? I 100% agree. You hit the core. Okay, good. If the small businesses can do that, that would be fantastic. But I also understand and cognizant that they are always short of time. They are always um, uh, in a tr- they are always in a trench mode. You know, they are always in a doing mode, and they don't have time to do that. I get it. So, and if you don't have time to do that, and then then adapt, right? Use a very formal informal process. Talking to your management, talking to the, the the people who create in the content, talking to your subject matter expert to get a sense of it. Mm-hmm. There's always a way to get information. It doesn't have to have a formal process to get that. But of course, you are totally right. The the small businesses, especially if they want to grow, and they, they there's a certain thing they have to emulate the what this what uh, the business the big businesses are doing well. And one thing is setting the process. And that process is really what allows them to scale. But it, right. at the beginning of that, you know, both you and I are very big advocates of planning and strategy. I mean, mainly, I would say, one, we, we're both firm believers in it. But two, because we're firm believers, that's what we do for a living. But one of the challenges that I always run into anytime I'm working with the clients on the smaller side is this question of time and resources that you you had mentioned. They don't have as much time. They don't have as many resources. And oftentimes, they don't have the expertise in-house. What are some of the, um, I don't want to say shortcuts, but you had said you don't need a formal process. What are some of kind of the quick tips for smaller companies to do some of this research, to do some of this thinking? Are there any resources online or templates, things that they can use that will kind of advance the ball down the field for them without a lot of time and money? Um, that's actually a very good question. Let me address that from two different perspectives. Um, I think I, I, am not going to call out a, a, a specific website that actually have that information. Uh, well, by the way, Jeff, do you actually have any templates that they can use? If you do, we should probably, uh, share that. Yeah. Well, I have, uh, I, I use a content calendar, uh, spreadsheet that I often will share with, you know, people when I'm doing a content strategy framework, um, or a session with them where I'm, I'm trying to plan content for three to six months, we'll use that. Um, I use uh, Copy Blogger has a, a great series of how to write great headlines uh, called Magnetic Headlines. And I often will recommend that for a lot of clients when they're trying to figure out how to make their um, content more compelling to even click on in the first place. So there's a lot of things I use like that. Um, I've also found a couple different content marketing frameworks around the web um, some of them are a little too high level for the small business people though. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree. And, um, so like I said, there's two ways I want to, uh, I, I, I would like to answer that. The first is, you know, everything is online, right? Mm-hmm. And if you are looking for even uh, a brand guides or create guides or even, uh, a, 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 a persona brain persona guidebook, if you just, uh, Google that and then enter, that in the keywords with templates, you probably will get a lot of uh, templates. And personally, I don't think templates is an issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is um, how did you put your own uh, mission, your own values, and your company's persona uh, onto paper? Does that make sense? There's a lot of templates out there maybe that can help you to get started. But ultimately, um, the, person that need, uh, the person that actually look into doing this is having a conversation with the founders. A lot of small businesses and founders are still running the business. Talk to them. Get a sense of who they are. Because how they run the companies tend to reflect into um, you know the, the the management and leadership style. Get a sense of what they are, and then understand what their values, understand what they stand for. I'm not saying founders equals the businesses. That's not my point. My point is they tend to that they tend to reflect their personality into the business, mm-hmm. and sometimes you have to take that into account. 
and also uh, having a conversation with the senior management team. Get a sense of that. Having that conversation, from my perspective, is more important than getting a template. So when you're having that conversation, you know, a lot of the listeners of this show are either entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, small business people, a lot of people that work in marketing and content marketing and uh, trying to figure this whole social media and content marketing thing out. And them going and having that conversation, the first thing that would be on a lot of their minds is, what sort of questions should I even be asking them? You know, what sort of questions would you go in and start talking to either the thought leaders in a company or, you know, the founder of the company? What are some things that you would want to pull out of them to get a better idea of, of what they stand for, what their messaging should be, what their brand is, who they're serving? You know, what are some of the questions you would ask? Okay. Um, if anybody is doing that, it should start it with a very casual conversation with, uh, with the founder or the senior management team. And especially with the founder, it's um, who they are and why do they found a company? Why are those products they are passionate about? What, is, what are the focuses for the next uh, couple of years? And what, um, what are um, his or her visions? What do they see the company should grow? And uh, if, if the founder is not in the trench all the time, what is his ideal company look like? So these are the couple questions. It's very much a why, who, and the what type of question. It's not how. It's not how to do this, how to do that. Mm -hmm. No, it's why are we doing it, who are we, and what are we doing, what are we growing? These are the type of questions that you should ask. Like I said, who, why, and what are the type of questions you should focus on. Okay, so once you have all of this, and, and let's say that you know we've now given enough um, in terms of resources and, and questions for the small business and the, biz, the big business alike to start this process, and they write down, they have their objectives, their messaging, and their brand. How did they go about then taking that information and getting their team organized around getting content out onto the web to drive a business objective. Let's say the business objective is driving leads or converting sales. We'll, we'll take kind of a more B2B context here. What, what do you think would be a good next step after that to get your team organized properly? Very, very good. So you ask a good questions. Now you have all the basic. Let's assume you have a business objective. You actually have uh, brain guides. You have the product messaging. Yeah. I think the next step now you understand yourself well. The next step is understanding your customers well. Okay, what are your customers' pain points, challenges, and desires? Who are they? Okay. Once you understand yourself well, which is you got that basic down, and you understand your customer well, then you can look at what you can offer, and also what are the customers' pain point challenges? How are you going to solve that? And from the angle of solving, solving the customer's pinpoint challenges as you create content that focusing on solving their problem and is content that's helpful and educational starting from there as you're content planning. Does that make sense, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, you obviously want to make something that's valuable for people that's either entertaining, it's emotive, it's educational. You know, you want to provide some sort of value to people. So, right. so you start with understanding yourself well. That's step one. And that means knowing your objective, your messaging, your brand, knowing what your company stands for, all that sort of good stuff. And then you need to understand your customer well. Customer. And, and yeah. do you advise building a persona? Yeah, I do, actually. And um, they so, could. I so for people that are listening that may have heard persona loosely, can you quick kind of give your definition of, of what, a, what a persona would be and how you go about creating one? Yes, I can. I am looking for an official definition on Google. <laughs> but so buyer's persona, I'm going to read this statement. Okay, I'm going to read it slowly for folks who are listening. Buyer's personas are fictional representations of your ideal customers. They are based on real data about customer demographics and online behavior along with educated Again, educated speculation about their personal histories, motivations, and the concerns. So if you think about it, really, that 
persona has a couple elements: demographics, behaviors, and their thinking process, thinking about how they reach a buying decision, their job descriptions or their working environments, their challenges related to obviously possible the product that you are selling, their goals, their desire. And、uh, also their attitudes, either toward a specific topic or toward a product. So these are the elements of、uh, a buyer's persona. And it, like I said, Google is our best friend. And if you search buyer's persona on Google, there are a lot of templates. And usually started with an image. You can pick an image of the、um, uh, uh, of your ideal customer, what he or she looks like. And give this person a name, and then you started writing. You know the background about, say, Ryan, or the background about Jeff, and the、uh, demographics about the Ryan or Jeff, and、uh, what makes him tick, and also what are some of the goals and challenges that、uh, he wants to accomplish. So this is sort of one of the remedies for the. So who is your target audience for the person who says everybody? You know, it's you know, if you're not targeting anyone, or if you're targeting everyone, you're targeting no one.、Um, and actually, it's funny that you mention、uh, the different resources you can Google. I put together probably a couple years back now a target audience Mad Lib, where essentially you just fill in the blanks to all of the questions that I ask, and it'll put together,、uh, it'll spit out for you, you know, kind of spelled out in a sentence structure who your target audience is. We're currently in the in the process of redoing it. Love it! I would、yeah. love to see that. And、yeah. I think you should share that with everybody.、Jeff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's on the website. I'll put it in the show notes of this one. But、um, I'll tell you this, just as my own experience, that I'll just throw it out there for anybody listening. But I can tell you that the buyer persona thing absolutely works, and I'll tell you how I know, because I've been in business since 2011, and we've had various revisions of the website. And I recently had、uh, brought on a couple people for my board of advisors, and one of them works in digital marketing, and he came through and he put. Us through the process that we put our clients through, and what wound up happening was is that we identified that we work with one very specific type of client over and over and over. They're our best client. They're the one that we work the best with. They're the easiest sales conversation. So he it, he like held up a mirror to us, and what we realized was that our website wasn't written to her. It's a it's a woman. It's written to me because I wrote it, and I was basically talking about how exciting social business is. So. <laughs> So we did this buyer persona, right? And and we named her Kirsten Mabley. She's 38. She's a director of marketing in Philadelphia, and we figured out all the different things that you know ran as a commonality amongst our best、uh, clients. What they what they go through with their daily struggles, and we redid the entire website around it. Well, wouldn't you know it? Three days later, literally three days later after we published this, we got the biggest lead we have ever gotten through our website, and we've since brought them on as a client. You go, Jeff. Yeah, well, personas. That's right. And you know what? I do not have such a great success story to share with you. However, I also modify my website multiple times. Yep. And I make it.、Um, originally, when I write it, it was very, very generic. And、um, I created a persona for the audience I want to target. Obviously,、mm-hmm. for enterprises. But it, but as an independent consultant,、um, getting an enterprise client is actually very challenging. And the purchasing cycle can be very, very long. Yep. So、um, what I did is I also modify my website big time, and、uh, and the target was specific client or customers I have in mind, and either they will buy my book, or they will give me a call and、um, and 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 ask me to actually help them on the content marketing efforts. Yeah, I totally agree. It's not I'm not necessarily say that it works for me 100, percent but I think it's a right approach and makes perfect sense to do it. And I think especially one of the things that is、um, is really relevant about what you're saying, especially the personas and and you know the the things you've talked about before this with understanding yourself and your customer well, is that the better you understand your customer, obviously the better you're going to be able to pinpoint that content directly to them. Which is why I was saying about the website, we literally said we understand you and here's what you're going through, and that really I think resonates with the people that are now coming through the website. But in terms of looking at this from a global perspective. You know, if you're working only domestically, obviously you're going to have a certain homogeny to the people that you're you're trying to target with content because they're all in one country. When you、yeah. begin to expand to other countries, though, how much does that actually 
factor in when, when you're thinking about the importance of personas and targeting and understanding people, how much more is that important? Uh, I've never, like, I've never actually done an international strategy yet. So that's, that's why I'm asking. I know you have experience with this. That's actually very important. And, uh, um, let me define uh, global in the uh, um, in the enterprise or uh, in within the internal corporation sense. Global really means um, the headquarters working with a regional team together to plan and execute marketing. Okay, mm -hmm. when you are talking about global marketing, and I'm looking, I'm defining global marketing not in the sense that oh my god, I'm running a global marketing campaign, so we need to have a TV commercial worldwide. No, I'm not talking about that. When I'm talking about global, I'm talking about uh, its internal process or internal definition of a headquarters working with a, a regional teams or local teams together. Okay, and of course, a lot of time headquarters want to define one persona that will work for I don't know 120 countries, but when the headquarters work with a regional team especially the regional team in the Asia-Pacific and the regional team in Europe, they're going to say, no, that one person you created is not going to work for our region. We need our own persona. And all of a sudden, you have, I don't know, 38 personas. That's not going to work. And that's not very efficient uh, to allocate your uh, a marketing budget because all of a sudden, you have a marketing budget that needs to support 38 personas. For example, so the prioritization comes into play. Okay, you have to determine what countries that you want to prioritize from marketing spend perspective. You need to understand where your biggest growth will be, and then identify some uh, key countries that you want to focus on. Everybody has limited marketing resources. Everybody has limited budget, so we cannot market to 128 countries. So we need to determine with the current budget that we have and also with the, 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 the this is where business strategies, uh, business objective comes in, what are some of the countries that we really need to focus on? Mm -hmm. Then that will drive a conversation in terms of a persona. It doesn't mean that you are focusing five countries, you need to have five persona. It depends on the industry, depends on the products, it depends on the segments, it also depends on the audience, right? For mm -hmm. example, McDonald's, I'm using this uh, uh, quite often. There's McVeggie uh, in India and uh, in Malaysia, they have a totally different menus. When the product and services are completely localized, when I say completely localized, then very likely you need local persona. Mm -hmm. However, Got it. IT manager of a global enterprise, okay, that's assume IT manager for global enterprise for Oracle, Cisco, and Dell. The IT manager for global enterprise, their concerns are very similar. Cybersecurity, collaborations, um, the tools that needs to be scaled across regions. The concerns are very, very similar. You probably can create one persona, IT manager of a large enterprise, and be done. And that will apply to multiple different countries. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It really depends on, I would say, uh, the product that you offer and uh, the company, the industry, and the audience. And there yeah, are probably other elements that we have to take into account. But it's really a conversation between the headquarter and also the local team. Okay. So when you're advising clients on building a high-performing team uh, to create content, um, which of the following do you find is probably most likely? Train people, fire people, hire people, or outsource? I'll say them again. Train the people you've got, fire people, hire new people, or outsource? Okay. Are you asking this from a global sense? Or you uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking in general, you know, to your point, you said, and, and I'm in complete agreement, Every client I've ever talked to has resource constraints. You know, there's no client that doesn't matter if you have a, a billion dollar budget, there's constraints at some point. There's always no budget because everything's allocated and this and that. So when you are trying to build a team, there become these questions of, can you work with the resources you have internally? And if you can't, 
should you be letting them go and bringing on new people who can fill that content role and the, the existing role that that person filled? Or do you outsource the content capabilities? Let me answer that question from marketing life cycles perspective. It depending on how, ma how mature your marketing organization is. If you, if it's a startup and a small company and you don't have a lot of people, very likely you probably either do it yourself, you train yourself to do it, or you outsource, okay? Mm -hmm. However, if you grow to some extent that you have more headcounts and um, your uh, organization is getting bigger, again, it's also, it's, it's about hiring and also about training, and there's probably a little bit of outsourcing. That's assume you grow even more, and now the team is even bigger, then you grow from a medium-sized company to even what I call a medium-big type of company, and then that's a discussion. Then that, that becomes a strategic discussion if you want to do it in-house or you want to do an outsource. Mm -hmm. And that's usually... Um, a discussion that will happen in a CMO level. It's a trade-off between if she he or she wants a headcount versus budget. And uh, sometimes the, if you grow to a certain size and the number of the heads that you can hire probably constrained, then the management will take the, the budget instead over headcounts. And if budget is much bigger, the chance of outsourcing is probably higher. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. What it's, I usually say is it's a question of time and money. I get it, but it, and I, I hate giving a one absolute answer for your audience, and I, they need to really look into where they are um, in, in terms of the, the, the stage of their, the company growth. Yeah, the advice I usually give is it's a question of time and money. If you have more time than you have money, you should be doing it in-house. If you have more money than you have time, then you should probably be outsourcing it. So if you know you guys are growing like gangbusters and you don't have the time to bring somebody on and train them, you bring in an outsource partner. But if you know you are you know busting your ass to try and get things done, the company isn't growing fast enough, and you don't have the budget to outsource, you got to bucker down or, or hunker down and do it in in-house. In-house. That's usually what I would say. Yeah. But I was looking, I, I guess I overthinking it, right? I was really thinking about a, a different stage of a company growth and I'm thinking, I'm overthinking it, Jeff. Yeah, okay. but that's what you're paid to do is to overthink things. <laughs> so, so take this, take this one and I want you to give me your simple definition of this because um, everybody that I talk to about content marketing and really so social media marketing, social business, they have this hang up about B2B versus B2C. Do you think that there's a big difference between marketing, specifically content marketing for B2B versus B2C? Because I don't think there's a huge difference. The, the nature of the content might be different, but I want your take on it. I think you hit the core. I think it's the nature of the uh, the content might be different. If you think about it, the essence of content marketing is to help, to educate, to entertain, to facilitate a buying process, or to challenge your customers. So it doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C, and hopefully whatever you are doing is to help, to educate, to entertain, to facilitate a buying process, or to challenge your customer. Mm -hmm. So it's no difference. But it comes down to which categories of content that will dial up and dial down, right? For B2B, you probably more focus on help and education type of content. For B2C, you probably more focus on entertaining and challenging, you know, or, or, or games or contests to challenge your customers. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, the ultimately the core is the same, but uh, what categories that you should dial up and dial down might be slightly different. The weight. Uh, of the uh, 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 categories of content that needs to be generated will be different. Got it. I'm in complete agreement. So let me ask you one last question because I know time is tight for both of us and I am going to just selfishly ask you a question that I want your take on. So I'm going to be talking in Vegas at the Social Media Strategy Summit. You're going to be there? No, unfortunately, I went out. Sad. I know. I told Brianna. I said uh, for this year, I I help uh, uh, Brianna, who is the VP of the Event Marketing for Social Media Strategy Summit, uh, several years. In fact, three years. 
So mm-hmm. I was in Las Vegas for three years straight, and unfortunately next year I have a conflict and I couldn't make it. Oh, sad. So sorry, Jeff. I cannot see you. Well, it's okay. They probably would have put us um, going opposite one another. I, I never seem to be able to get uh, to see any of the other speakers uh, that I'm close with. I never get to see them speak. Um, but my the one that I'm going to be talking about is um, really how to scale content marketing by using systems. And some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is, for instance, using something like If This Then That or Zapier to make it so that when you do one thing in one place, it creates content in another place. So sort of trigger and action um, mechanisms as well as some other systems that I have. Do you have any tips that you want uh, to share with me that I may be able to use in my workshop to help people content market more effectively using technology, systems, anything like that? Um, I... uh... You know, the, I, I don't have uh, a recommendation on tools, and I think you are a whole lot more competent and sophisticated than I am. You probably have tons of recommendations on tools. Um, the way I, I see in terms of scaling, and uh, Jeff, if you want to, you can probably um, um, create your create your content to address four different topics, uh, four different uh, areas. Mm-hmm. You know, usually there are four things you need to consider in terms of scaling people strategy, process, and tools. And uh, process and uh, the, the, the tools and strategy, you are the expert. You probably can address that. What you should touch a little bit is actually on people and also process. Mm-hmm. And these two can very easily tie together in a way that um, um, competent people working together, right? And that's a process. You need to talk about in terms of the prerequisite of scaling is that you actually have the people that are willing to communicate, willing to compromise, and willing to work together. And if they are not willing to do that, it doesn't matter what kind of tools and system that you have in place, it's not going to scale because they will not use it. I love it. I I have a similar Venn diagram that I use in some of my talks where I use um, the three components to success in social media are um, – technology, culture, and process. So very similar to what you're saying. I I think that good strategy includes all three. Yes, yes. I usually put strategy in the center. Yeah, I dig that. Tools and uh, people and also the process, like as a three circle, you know, surround strategy. Got it. We might even be using the same picture at this point. Um, Because I think without um, all three of those, you wind up with an incomplete picture. You know, if you have only two of them, you're going to wind up maybe with something that's slow and buggy, or you'll wind up with something that's, um, you know, just kind of missing the mark, or it's a good good idea, but it, in practice, it doesn't work. So in terms of what I'm talking about with the content marketing systems, um, do you ever talk about with your clients about what sort of systems they have, you know, the process they have to bring their people together to brainstorm ideas out? Maybe the communication between, say, customer service and sales or sales and marketing and how ideas and questions that come back from customers can feed into the content strategy? Yeah, totally. Um, are you talking about having a conversations with the customers? Yeah, or really like any of the, like what sort of processes, you, you had mentioned process in this. You know, what are some of the things that you address there that, um, you know, just as I'm trying to think of how to piece these all together, because I really was trying to figure out, you know, I, I have the technology side of it down in this conversation. What I'm looking for is to expand it a little bit more and talk about how you get your people more involved. And I'm thinking about some of the technology to do that, but I'd like your ideas on, on some of the processes to go about getting people connected and talking about content marketing. Yeah. So there are a couple ways. From my perspective, the best way to get people together is face-to-face. Yeah. But unfortunately, due to travel budget constraints or whatnot, and uh, to get everybody together is very, very, um, uh, it's not necessarily feasible. And it might be challenging. Mm-hmm. And my take on this is to get people uh, on the same same page, and um, um, not necessarily all the time, but make sure that they focus on the the content marketing. The most important thing is actually have regular meetings. And it sounds very very sad, but it is true. Um, to actually have uh, uh, the the process I'm talking about is really a communication process that have a regular meeting that was established agenda and then and can talk about some of the issues and, uh, and the concerns that everybody has. 
Got and it. the way I see the, the people and the process together is really communication. And what kind of communication? It's really through um, either regular meetings or regular email updates or even annual get together uh, during the, uh, the planning process. It doesn't matter. You've got to have some sort of mechanism that, 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 that tie everybody together. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the way to do it is a regular meeting. There's no way out. Got it. Awesome. Well, Pam, you are freaking awesome. I'm so glad that you were able to come on to you Conversations. Are too, Jeff. You are freaking awesome as Oh, I hope to see you at something soon. But um, in the meantime, for the people that are listening and want to go find out more about you, the fabulous book that you wrote, the fabulous work you're doing, where to see you speak, where can they go to be social with you and learn more? Um, they can obviously follow me on Twitter at Pam Dittner. If you can, please. I'm begging. Can you tell I'm begging people to follow me? <laughs> I'm joking, really. You know, it's uh, totally up to you. And uh, if you are interested in content marketing, especially global content marketing, how to scale content across regions, and I have a website, globalcontent.marketing. Yes, marketing is a domain name. So globalcontent.marketing. And you can check out the content there. And uh, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out as well. Rockin'. Pam, you are way cool. Thank you for coming on the show. For all of you out there listening, thanks for listening. Thanks for always coming back and listening to our amazing conversations with brilliant people like Pam. And please come back for the next one. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This has been Conversations, the True Voice Media Podcast. And if this is your first time listening, please do us a favor and drop by iTunes or Stitcher and give us a rating. Tell us what you love about the show and what we can do to improve the show. If you're not yet a subscriber, you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, or you can be notified by email about new episodes. To subscribe, just drop by truevoicemedia.com slash conversations. Tune in next time where I bring on another incredible guest and have another interesting conversation. See you next time.